Hi, everyone. Oh, I have to move this. Sorry. You're not going to hear me otherwise. All right. Hi, everyone. I'd like to share with you Monster of the Week, how to be brave when facing the horror stories of web development. My name is Jen Weber, and I work for a small startup called BioBright, where I'm head of product building apps for scientific research. I'm on the Ember Learning team. I wrote the shortest Ember book, and I'm afraid of absolutely everything. So I have a pretty good imagination, and the downside of that imagination is that I can think of every worst case scenario in excruciating detail. Much of my career, uh, my main challenge has been to train myself to do things I want to do anyway, even though I was scared out of my mind to try them. And honestly, there's a lot of reasons that fears like that hold us back. There's a lot in the world to be afraid of. And as software developers, we have to encounter some fears in our professional careers that are a little different than other industries experience. Um, for us, one mistake, one typo, one accidental push to master could wreck everything for thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people at once. Um, so we all have an enormous responsibility. We don't talk about it much, but it's something that weighs on us. So via Twitter, I asked some developers for their best developer horror stories. And over the next half hour, I'm going to share a paraphrase of some of those stories. And I'm going to show you some uh, creatures that emerged out of those stories that people shared. So we're going to grab our garlic, our steaks, our flare guns, our flashlights. We're going to confront the creatures that haunt us. And we're going to get some tools to help us train others to overcome them as well. So um, no camping trip is complete without scary stories and arts and crafts. So everyone should have one of these. If you don't, there's more in the back there. During this talk, every time I tell you something that reminds you of yourself or something you've heard other people say, I want you to make a little mark or a design on this, uh, around the edges of this little paper. You're going to scratch it away. But leave the middle empty, because at the end, you're going to write something there. So you know, an example might be something like this. So if you're not familiar, Monster of the Week is a trope in television, comics, movies, where um, you know, rather than fighting one great big bad boss at the end, uh, our heroes, our characters um, fight smaller monsters every week. So we're talking about like Supernatural, Warehouse 13, Buffy, the X-Files, and uh, you know, that's kind of like us. Every week that comes by, we could be facing something new that we've never seen before. So let's see what kind of monsters we're up against. First up is the data beast. The data beast is a fearsome creature. It thrives on the fear that our mistakes will cause catastrophic, irreversible losses that anger both our customers and our fellow engineers. The database makes us afraid to take on technical challenges that are outside of our comfort zones. So one, uh, one Twitter participant shared this story. We released a feature that let our clients delete customers in order to satisfy GDPR. <laughs> Due to a bug, some clients deleted all their customers, and we had to roll back the database. So what weapons do we have against the data beast? The main one is to ask for help. So think of all the horror movies you've seen and how many people do not succeed. But do you know who always survives? It's Shaggy and Scooby. They make it to the end. Even though Fred says, hey, everyone, let's split up. They don't. <laughs> so in a way, you know, we should have some healthy caution about wrecking our customers' stuff. Um, but we want to make sure that it's not, uh, it's not an overabundance of that caution that keeps us from trying out new responsibilities. So your weapon here against the data beast is things like pair programming or remembering that 
for anything that you put out into the world, the responsibility for that code is probably not all on you. It's probably shared with your team. It's probably shared a little bit with your customers as you do some tests and pilots together. So in many cases, these fears are just indications that either some process or tooling needs work, um, or that you just need to you know, find a pal. Next up is the mini tar. The mini tar is caused by fear of typos, off by one error, small mistakes, the things that just sort of slip by. A minotaur becomes a mini tar when you get one letter wrong. <laughs> he's, he's silly, like those typos, but all the same, he can wreak havoc on your work and on your company. And he's especially scary to developers who are just starting out. One Twitter respondent said, I once accidentally merged our alpha branch into a release branch. Another coworker grabbed the code too without knowing my mistake. Yet another developer tried to revert and failed. It took us a week to clean up the mess in Git. So who here is uh, afraid of making those kinds of mistakes? Who here has made those kinds of mistakes? Yeah. So uh, to defeat the Minitar, your weapon is really just to talk to other developers. One developer I know keeps a public fail log on their portfolio site. Um, and it's really refreshing to see that other people, including this really awesome developer, um, they make mistakes. But on the other tab of that portfolio is a list of the work that that person has done, some really incredible amazing things. And there's something that's comforting in seeing those side by side, you know, if I've just made a mistake and I'm feeling pretty bad. Like there's something, there's something that's the, the reverse of that situation. Our next monster is the Cyclops. The Cyclops rears its ugly head when there's monotony. In the words of a few respondents, these are their greatest daily fears as developers. They're worried, I'll get complacent, that I won't enjoy it anymore, that I won't want to push myself for a challenge. The key to defeating the Cyclops is to realize that you're probably not trapped in that situation and then do something about it. So one of my favorite scary video games is called Amnesia. Has anyone here played Amnesia? All right, good, awesome. Uh, you know, it's uh, in this game, you're fighting some pretty scary stuff that you don't really understand. You're in this huge, sprawling mansion, and you're, you're trapped, except that there's windows everywhere in this game. The character could just pick up this chair, bust out that window, and get out of dodge, but they don't. <laughs> The trouble is that it takes a lot of effort to break out of whatever cycle is holding you in place. So maybe breaking out looks like finding a new job or squaring away some time to learn a new skill. Maybe it's you know having some meetings with the people around you to find a way to match your career goals and interests to the opportunities that are available to you there. When you're facing the Cyclops, though, you're demotivated and you have low energy for doing those kinds of things. So you need more than just this realization in order to fight off the Cyclops. Your tools are to do some goal setting and track your progress. The term SMART goal was coined in 1981 by George T. Doran. SMART goal means specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. I first learned about SMART goals when I was working on a sales team that had impossibly high uh, targets. And every month that went by, my team missed those targets. We went for months and months and months of seeing numbers that looked like failure. And no matter what we did, we couldn't achieve those things. That's really a recipe for burnout when you feel like your work isn't getting you anywhere. And a colleague taught me that in the face of that situation, what I needed to do was set my own goals instead. So when you're working on a SMART goal, 
you take a huge goal and break it into tiny steps that help you get you to where you need to be. That gives you a sense of progress. It gives you something that you can regularly celebrate. So let's use an example here of looking for a new job. If your goal is to find a new job that's awesome and exciting, you are going to have to wait a few months. There's going to be a few months where you don't succeed, where you don't meet your goals. And it's pretty easy to burn out and give up on that. But if your goal is to do one networking event per month and one job application per week, all of a sudden you could meet your goals and give yourself a pat on the back at least once a week. And if you don't meet that week's goal, well, it's not I'm going to apply for 40 jobs and now I'm so far behind and how will I catch up? It's, it's a new week. I'm going to try to do it this week. Next up is the Crypt Keeper. The Crypt Keeper is always quietly watching, waiting for the death of our careers because of who we are or who we become. So things like getting older, having a family, challenging societal gender expectations, being a person of color, moving to a new city. The strength of the Crypt Keeper is when those fears come up again and again and again until they become part of our subconscious decision-making process. When you add those fears to the real, actual, systemic challenges that we're facing in the world around us, you're looking at a really tough, really scary situation. The Crypt Keeper says things like, my fear is that becoming older means less opportunity for employment. While I can imagine myself coding at 40, I can't see myself employable as a 50 to 60 year old. The key to defeating the Crypt Keeper is to expect change. Now, I tend to have an existential crisis about quarterly, like, what am I doing? How did I get here? Is this where I wanted to be? What if I've made all the wrong choices? And so during the last one, one of my colleagues sent me this very article from a publication that's called Wait But Why. And the article describes this creature, the yearning octopus. All of its tentacles are in competition to achieve attention and satisfaction. So for example, um, the desire for personal fulfillment, achieving your potential, could be at odds with the desire to have like a chill lifestyle with some hobbies on the side. If you want to, a lot of people say, I want to go work for a startup, it's so exciting, but do you really want to give up, uh, I don't know, video games, time to hang out with friends? Maybe it cuts into time to hang out with family. And if you look at this creature, it's not ever really happy because it's always in a state of tension. And that's normal. This article helps you discover where your motivations are and what skills you have that won't go out of style. Additionally, the author suggests that uh, part of the reason we get so worked up about this is that uh, when we think of careers, we think of them as one linear 40-year tunnel. But in reality, they're meandering, shifting things. Furthermore, every decade, uh, the world around us changes in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. So 10 years ago, um, I wouldn't have imagined myself here chatting with you. I hadn't ever touched a smartphone at that point. And so, you know, now we have this new fear, which is that we'll be utterly unprepared for the next technological revolution and we'll be old. But what's the solution? <laughs> it really helps to stay in touch with your own goals and ambitions, evaluate them regularly, expect that they will change, that you will change, that the world around you will change, and build up your own skills of self reflection to help you to adapt when they do. So I encourage everyone, Google the yearning octopus and you'll find this article. The I'm not ready yeti <laughs> thrives on times when we say, ah, I'm not ready to do that yet without exactly defining what being ready would look like and a plan to get there. 
This one I didn't have to go to Twitter for because I hear it at almost every meetup and conference and uh, Discord chat about giving talks, about writing articles. Uh, the I'm not ready yet E says things like, I need to learn more before I can ask for a raise. I'm too inexperienced to have something useful to say. We're all afraid that if we jump ahead a little too far, things might go wrong. And if we just wait until it feels right to take on a new challenge, um, that's the best way forward. To defeat the I'm not ready yet ye, you need to practice the art of good enough. This is from the horror game series Silent Hill. And in this game, <laughs> Tom, you played it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, in this game, the protagonist uh, faces a reality that is somewhat of their own making, where you and I might see a door that we can just walk through. They might see this impossible barrier, one that's not really there. And the irony is that, you know, as this character, even after you've collected all the various keys and weapons and experience points and everything, when you get to the final challenge, you're still so weak. It's not a cakewalk. And sometimes we create these kinds of barriers for ourselves. We all have different perceptions of the situations that we're in. And in a certain way, we're responding to our own idea of that reality. So, you know, we imagine that there's going to be magically this day when we're ready to fight this final boss. And, you know, I've done a few things in my career so far, and I can't say that I felt ready for any of them. To defeat the I'm not ready Yeti, you have to practice the art of good enough, meaning don't wait until you feel ready to make some waves. If, if you feel ready, you might have waited too long. So, I think of this most commonly in mentoring situations, um, you know, where someone says, I feel like I'm not good enough at coding yet to get my first job or something like that. And you could say, oh, here's a great JavaScript tutorial. Here's a blog article that helped me. Or you could say, you know, what would make you, how, how would you know that you were ready? What would make you feel ready? And suggest some resources along those lines and set up a follow-up meeting. Then when they can say, ah, I've made some incremental progress on this, this or that thing, you could say, hey, I think you might be ready to try it out. They'll say, no, 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 no. You're like, ah, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe. If you say that enough times, they might get moving. Another way to defeat the Yeti is by shifting your perspective on your own abilities. So there's this book called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And the four agreements are to be impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions, and my favorite, which is always do your best. Ruiz says that your best is going to change from moment to moment. It will be different when you are healthy as opposed to sick. Under any circumstances, simply do your best and you will avoid self-judgment, self-abuse, and regret. Defeating the I'm not ready yeti means freeing yourself from comparing yourself not just to others, but also to your past performance. So, <laughs> next up, who loves Harry Potter? Yeah, all right. So, um, you might be familiar with the disappointmenters who steal your motivation and drain your life energy. They thrive on fear of letting others down, whether that's coworkers, clients, the audience of a conference talk, um, or <laughs> heaven forbid, the people we look up to the most. The disappointmenters strike when you're about to try something new, or maybe you're on top of the world and everything's amazing, but you're paralyzed by the feeling that, oh no, what if it all disappears tomorrow? So, in one, uh, one horror story, I was seeing a therapist because my anxiety about making a client-facing mistake was taking a toll. I then emergency debugged a production server while sitting on the sidewalk outside my therapist's office. <laughs> the key to defeating the disappointmenter is to bring the right equipment. 
So the Ghostbusters, they know that they're in for some bad situations when they head out the door for the day, but they're empowered to tackle them because they've done some preparation. So what can we do to prepare for that crushing feeling that we might disappoint ourselves, we might disappoint others? Step one for preparing for something stressful is to make sure that you're at full power. So this can be at odds with the stressful situation because, you know, it might involve some late nights coding. But even then, it's really helpful to take a step back and think, is the stress and anxiety that I'm feeling right now, uh, is it purely situational? Or am I also making it worse by putting stress on my body? So there was this one day at work when uh, I was sitting at my desk and I had some important client emails to write and my heart was pounding and all of the things that I was worried about were kind of just like piling on in my mind. And it was so much that my coworker picked up on it. And she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, oh man, my heart is just racing and I'm worried. And she says, did you have any water today? And I was like, no, I had two cups of coffee. <laughs> 10 minutes ago, and she says, and she's like, yeah, you might wanna go take care of that. And when I was done drinking some water, I was still worried, I was still stressed out, but my heart wasn't racing anymore. I was better equipped for the day's challenges after I had taken care of those things. And then when it comes to sleep, so like, let's imagine that I woke you up every day at 4.30, uh, or not, not every day because that would, you know, you might get accustomed to the pattern. Every once in a while, wake up at 4.30, have to suffer through some really difficult technical task. After a while, that might start to weigh on you. You might end up crying at your desk when I ask you to fix a linter error because everything has just piled on. So it's not that much different to habitually shortchange yourself on sleep. And so the results are kind of unsurprising when we can't deal with the stress. Another weapon against the disappointmenters is to think things all the way through. Cognitive behavioral therapy aims to challenge unhelpful thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, and helps a person develop coping strategies or new information processing skills. That's from Wikipedia. <laughs> um, it's focused on action-oriented problem solving as opposed to sort of this deep introspection of subconscious behaviors. Um, some psychologists, Beck and their team, created a concept of a dysfunctional thought journal in 1995. The idea was that if you take a step back and reflect on those crushing dis disappointmenter type thoughts and reflect on them, they can become more manageable. So the horror story I used, uh, I, I talked about earlier, we're going to use that as an example here. So the automatic thought uh, sitting on the sidewalk is it's the end of the world. The clients will dump us, you know, should have seen this specific problem coming, but that's probably not true. The next question is, is there an alternative explanation? Could it be that things broke in a way that couldn't have been ex anticipated? The next is to consider what's the best that could happen? What's the worst? What's the most realistic? Just as the imagination can be powerful when it's turned against us, it's also a powerful weapon against the disappointmenter. The best case scenario is one where a problem is resolved quickly. The worst case is there's some downtime and most realistic is it'll be, you know, somewhere in the middle and other engineers will jump in to help. The next step is to ask yourself what you would tell a friend in this situation. If a friend was in this situation, I'd remind them that production resources are team responsibilities for both success and failure, and that the team as a whole would figure it out one way or another. So by embracing the worst case scenario, sometimes as well, sensible prevention measures are revealed. Maybe it's testing, maybe it's you know, having a better QC process. Maybe there's things that we can do to protect ourselves from experiencing this any more than it's absolutely necessary. So nearly everyone faces these monsters at some point or another. Um, you know, I know I have, 
And the lessons that you've seen here, they're not my ideas. They're things that other people who I look up to, my own mentors and teachers, helped me to build up as skills. And you know, despite the best advice of some of these people, uh, a lot of times those fears didn't go away. But the thing that changed was that I had some tools that I could use to overcome them. So in that story earlier about someone who sat on the sidewalk debugging production servers outside their therapist's office, that was me. And in that moment of like panic of what could be going wrong, instead of completely freaking out, I was able to think, OK, I have a couple tools to kind of calm down, think about the situation, imagine what the different scenarios could be, and then act. I was able to be helpful to my colleagues. So the theme of our conference is it's easy in Ember. And what I thought of when you know, I first heard this theme is like, easy for who? So we have to be careful with the word easy, because what's easy for me might not be easy for you, and vice versa. And when we're fighting these monsters, some people end up fighting stronger monsters using weaker tools, or maybe pay, they pay a higher price in order to defeat them due to situations that are outside of their control. So you know, is Ember easy for introverts? Is it easy for someone who's living with mental illness? Is it easy for someone who did an online coding boot camp and they're looking for their first job? You know, what about people who feel alone, who look around and think, there's no one else here like me? Or they say to themselves, look at all those experts up there on the stage. It'll be a long time before I'm ready to do something like that. So we might not always be able to make it easy for everyone all the time, but we can certainly shoot for easier. There are always things that we can do better. We can always strive to set a good example in the broader tech community and amongst ourselves. We can build up our own skills as compassionate, bold people and excellent mentors. We can guide each other through the hard parts. So none of these strategies here are a magic bullet. They don't change systemic problems in tech. But they're your tools for crafting your own responses, for doing something anyway, if it seem, even if it seems like it might be difficult. And these same tools can be applied to help turn the tide on those systemic problems. You might be able to use them to stand up for yourself, to stand up for others, speaking up when you see someone being treated unfairly, combating discrimination and bias, um, protesting unethical software or customer data you know, management decisions. All of those things are really scary, but they're also really important. You know, Even just being a mentor is scary, but making a tech community that's inclusive, welcoming, ethical, and exciting is up to all of us, and in many cases, it involves overcoming our own fears. So um, you should have an empty space still in the center of your note here. So we're going to take just a minute to answer this question. What's one lesson you want to remember? What's something that you want to do to challenge yourself? And it can be from this talk. It could be from the other conversations you've had with people on the side. It could be from the other presenters. But think about that for a moment, that what's your main takeaway that you would like to remember? And go ahead and write that down on here. All right, so if you feel so inclined and you want to share what you've learned with other people, um, go ahead and use that hashtag EmberCamp. I'd really love to see what your takeaways are from this conference. So um, I'd like to leave you with these closing thoughts. So 
you know, sometimes it's true that you should wait to try to tackle something scary. Sometimes it's true that you're not ready yet for something. But next time you catch yourself thinking these thoughts, I'd like you to please remember that when you use the tools you have, the other side looks a lot less scary. Thanks, everyone. Yeah! Good job!